Thank God it's almost over. Anyone feeling like that? No? No. She's tired. She can not go. <laughs> She'll need to be here. Sorry? You'll have to get it yourself. Yeah. And how have the two days been? Interesting? Sorry? Informative. You can take back good ideas, things that will work for you, will not work for you. That is also equally important. We still have a few minutes before we start officially. But thought till that time, we'll see if no one is having coffee, at least we'll have some conversations to wake up. Maybe. So which has been the most interesting session so far? You said it was informative, which was the most informative session for you? No? Very different. Uh, Hmm. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> Absolutely. Hmm. Hmm. Good. Good, good. Anyone else found any really interesting sessions? No? Hopefully this will be your most interesting session. Almost end with a bang, right? Do you want to start? Wait for one more minute. Officially wait for the clock to take 4.15. Okay. Mic is there. Yeah. So guess we'll get started. It's uh, time. Okay. Yeah. That was when she was a QA. Yeah, and now she's a developer. Thank you so much. Yeah. So as you I'm Anand Bagmar uh, with ThoughtWorks in six and a half years. Been doing various different types of testing for quite some time now. I enjoy testing whatever it, uh, whatever involves testing or building a quality product. I jump in and get involved over there. That's enough about us. We've got our uh, Twitter IDs up on the screen. The slides will be available on SlideShare. Video has been taken, so don't bother about really writing down what is there on the screen, of course. It will be available to you. Other contact information can be found uh, from the About Me uh, page as well. And of course, I'm still, we are still around for the rest of the day today to have more conversations uh, following this. So today, we'll be talking to you about sharing our pain. We are really glad you are here in big numbers because the more people we share the pain with, the quicker it subsides, right? That's what we hope to do. We want to share what we have gone through as challenges and how we have potentially overcome them as well. That is just our perspective of it. That said, why are you here on a Saturday evening? Yes, you have paid for the conference, but why else are you here? Colors are really bad. What do you expect from this session? Sorry? Excellent. So I'm hoping we'll be able to know some of your solutions as well to the challenges that we have faced or are still facing. Okay. Anything else? Any other expectations? 
what is protractor? I don't know anything about it. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. We'll not be talking about what is protractor. We'll just introduce it briefly. Yeah. Uh, but once you look it up, the documentation is fairly good. And after that, you'll be able to apply what you hear today. Okay. Anything else? Good question. Web driver is already there. Why do we want protractor as well? We will be covering those aspects in certain levels of detail. Sure, sure. Why protractor? Why should I leave Java and learn something new? Uh, so there has to be some good reasons to do that, right? So yes, in some ways we will be talking about that uh, for sure. Anyone else? Any other expectations from the session so that we are clear about yes, we'll be able to meet that or not? Okay, great. What we are going to do is we are going to share a case study of a project that we are working on currently. And as part of that case study, we'll be sharing some of the learnings that we've come up with. This case study is about optimization, workforce optimization for any industry. You can take a um, uh, think about it as a automobile industry having to optimize how their salespeople need to be spread out in the region to generate more sales. Think about it in that way. Okay. So the domain could be any, but we are going to assume it's an automobile industry. Uh, the product is supposed to be able to cater to any geography, but of course we are going to be focusing on, now uh, we started focusing on North America and soon our project is evolving into supporting other regions as well. So optimizing the workforce in different regions, which also brings up questions like localization, uh, of course, but so far we are a little bit away from that. This data of optimizing is going to be churning big numbers and it's going to be shown in very visual manners, a lot of maps, charts, in some cases big tables as well. So given the volume of data and the nature of uh, visuals that would be shown, it's not suited for small devices. So our supported browsers are the four big browsers, Safari, Firefox, uh, Chrome and Internet Explorer, thankfully 11 plus, but it's also on larger screens. So laptops, desktops, or whichever larger screens is there. That is our use case from this particular product. Little more understanding of this product. This is a single page application, as is the nature of uh, sites these days, uh, single page application. It is built in Angular using D3, Google Maps, and of course, because of all this, there's also a lot of Ajax components to this. The architecture is very straightforward. Everything that you see in the browser is the application. It is going to talk directly to the database to put information in there or to retrieve information uh, from the database. There is a small layer of course in between to talk to the database, but that is just a trivial wrapper of sorts. All business logic is implemented in this front end application itself. Okay. Now is the time for a big disclaimer. I admit openly in front of everyone. This is the first time I'm working on JavaScript on an Angular application. My second attempt at trying to use Protractor and so far it's going okay. Okay. I don't know about Nikita. In fact, for Nikita, it was even a bigger turnaround because a prior experience has been in completely different type of development. It's mobile applications, native applications. You ask her about different iOS, Android type of devices, and she'll be able to talk about it at length. So completely different uh, type of application for us that we are working on. So why Protractor? Given these constraints, why Protractor? It just does not make sense, right? Completely new technology. Why do we want to select that? And it's important to understand certain things of the team dynamics to see why we chose this. We work in the agile way. 
Uh, for those of uh, you who might have not realized, we are from ThoughtWorks, of course, all our projects are in the Agile uh, way of execution. In Agile, the team owns quality. It's not the QA responsibility. That's why we have a developer over here who's also equally talking passionately about testing side of things. If team owns quality, that means it's not just one set of team members who's going to be doing that. Everyone needs to contribute effectively to doing that. That includes our product owners, BAs, developers, and QAs as part of it. That's one. Second, we strongly believe in the value that test or test pyramid brings to the table. What value it brings to the team. We believe in the quick feedback cycle out of it and we also believe that the NFRs are a core part of your testing activities. To enable the test pyramid on the team, do effective types of non-automated testing and even more effective types of automated tests to get quick feedback is essential for us to deliver a quality product in a quick release cycle. Every iteration, we should be ready to go live. The team composition itself is very interesting. We have 10 developers and two QAs on the team. Except for one developer who knew Angular before, everyone is a full stack developer, mainly focused on server side applications. Excellent in designing software, building software, but everyone is now focused on building this application in Angular. Okay? That is what the team composition is like. Now, given these constraints, we looked at various different options. Someone mentioned over here, we already have WebDriver. Why did we look at uh, Protractor? When you choose any tool set or any tech stack, you have to consider a lot of dynamics. The context is very important in which you would be choosing your tool set, your tech stack. Given this set of context, given this type of application architecture, the kind of visuals and all that is there, as a tester, or as a QA on the team, my first choice would have been, Okay, let's use uh, Cucumber uh, Ruby or Cucumber JVM, for example. I love that uh, tech stack, that tool set. It's beautiful, it's very easy to use. Anyone can use it. But question that came in my mind was, do I really need that BDD layer? Why am I adding that complexity on top of it? Though it's a wrapper, what am I getting by adding the, introducing that complexity? The product itself is quite complex. I don't need anything else for it. So, okay, but that is an option. Let's think about it. There was, of course, WebDriver.js, since it's a JavaScript stack, everyone is, uh, the code is in JavaScript. Why not just use JavaScript for it? Now, the first option we shot down very quickly, Cucumber JVM uh, or Ruby, for two reasons. One, we don't need that overhead of an additional wrapper of BDD. We don't have that kind of requirement or that kind of collaboration that is there. And second, it's a completely different language to what the developers would be using to build that product functionality, which would mean they have to switch the IDs to understand what tests are there. It might mean different build configurations to make sure your tests are running in the same code base. We definitely do not want our tests to be in a separate code base than what our product code is doing. So very quickly we knew that JavaScript is the option to go at, and of course WebDriver.js is great uh, for that. But when we started reading about Angular itself, Protractor came into the question, and Protractor is the recommended tool set to use from automation perspective for Angular applications. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go ahead. The next thing is what does our so what we do is that at first we try to keep everyone tested and hence protractor comes into the picture. Now uh, having said that, we talk about what the challenges that we face within this context using our application and using protractor. The first one being uh, JavaScript itself. Now what is test automation? In test automation what you usually do is you have a single set of execution. You perform a certain action. You see what the output of that action is, and then you observe whether the output is something that you're expecting it to be. This works very well in the DAO world, where even the code that you write can be synchronous, and it's easy to read and understand. But when it comes to JavaScript, the power of JavaScript lies in its asynchronous nature. So if you compare 
what uh, the indulgement, what, uh, what is used is the autonomy that God has. You fire a certain task that needs to be done. Once the task is completed, then you get a call back as to what was the response of that task. <coughs> so if you try and map these two, what we want to do is we want to have a synchronous, step-by-step -step execution to be done in a language which is powerful in its early influence state. Then self is a big challenge for us to think in early influence the other aspect over there to understand uh, by E2E test what we really mean, right? It's the functional UI automation test that we are writing at the top of the pyramid. And these are not just granular validations. I open a browser, I validate a certain action uh, and its behavior. These are user journeys that we are really trying to identify and automate, which means it's not just one step. It's potentially a good workflow that we are trying to execute and we want to do assertions, validations along the way in that process. So this synchronous mapping in an asynchronous world becomes even more challenging when we have that kind of a user journey that we are looking at. I, I think the most issue is that we take for granted the API right side of the equation. And uh, since we are new to JavaScript and the call back is with it, we try to take control levels to see what is being, what is getting executed. But in the early internet nature, you can just consider all the steps of the dot to understand when a query is fired and when it is successfully executed on the browser and then you're getting um, the next is about uh, browsers and OS settings. So a little bit more about our development and our CI and our actual environments. We work on Mac. So we have a Linux box or on which we have our local development program. On our CI, we have a, a, a Linux to the enterprise a separate OS system altogether, which is also there in our environments. In a way to map what we have in CI and our environments, we also have a local Debian box which runs another flavor of Linux which is open to the Linux. So given that we have three different environments and we have tests, the benefit of tests is running them as quickly as possible to get feedback at each and every step from your local, your CI to actually running it against your environment. So that is a practice we follow very diligently. Before any code commit happens in Git, the developer or the tester, whoever is uh, updating code, whether it's product side or test side, should be running all the tests locally before that code is pushed into Git. So it's a very important aspect for us to be able to run the test on local machine before we say, yes, this is good to go inside Git. So as a developer, right, when I'm running my E2E test, and he is not as a developer, if I have something like a Chrome browser, which is typically on my face and, in, and just interrupting me in between of whatever I'm doing, it's not a pleasant thing to run. So usually you see developers running away from running e tests on their local machines and then committing code, like failing on the CI and then on their company. And the other reason is well, pointing out the reason for it. Hence, the first thing that we wanted is to run tests on a headless browser so that it is not an invasive and developers or even testers for that matter can continue working on whatever they're working on. So we looked at pattern JS, given it was easier to develop it, and uh, given our CI environment is also a virtual machine, we wanted a uh, headless uh, option for it. Unfortunately, uh, Phantom JS is not officially recommended by the environment. If we look at the documentation, it has an explicit statement saying that that it's possible we do not do that, but there are so many things that can go wrong. And we ourselves officially do not recommend working with Phantom JS. Another aspect of uh, trying to use Phantom JS, because the CI environment was not controlled by us, it is some other technical support team which manages environments. Another option of running in headless mode is to use, uh, we heard Dave's session yesterday, there are a couple of options, right? Uh, is to use XVFB and then run the actual browsers in headless mode over there. But what that meant is really working a lot with those teams to set up the XVFB and everything to get the browser set up correctly. So we thought, okay, let's try and avoid that and see if we get the same kind of feedback from PhantomJS, why not? Uh, it worked very well for us in development and testing, but unfortunately, there were certain cases where we found that certain elements were not used to run code, but they used to work amazingly well in Firefox. Having, uh, so we also looked at Firefox, given it's also an end user environment. It worked locally, so we thought maybe we found our uh, candidate for it to work on CI as well, like Anand was mentioning, using namespace 
and uh, you don't see it. Uh, like Anna said, we have uh, one of our modules uh, where visualization is done based on maps. So in the module, wherever maps was involved, are there in this field with HPSB and Firefox. Interestingly, it used to come on the basic box with the number of the open source of the open source. So this combination of uh, A the browser, B the operating system that it's running on, whether it is running on the edge or the headless phone, which is play without the display, were very, very challenging for us. I think it is still challenging for us yeah. as well. Um, the next thing was about the build for information. Since we chose programming as an unaccounted backing on CI, given our inherited code, we also have guys as the build for information. So the first thing we thought we would keep our system and then use and run program to test using GULF itself. The first Google search gave us something called a GULF Angular program. We thought maybe it sounds too good because we have GULF, we are Angular and programmer. Great, it sounds like the best combination that we can give us. And uh, that's how it is. We turned a little deep into it, what GULF Angular program actually is a plugin, which for the number of plugins, which is called GULF Programmer, which eventually uses programmer and Selenium web driver. This worked for us in the first couple of tests that we did. Uh, then, as we started writing more tests, we required a higher version of Selenium web driver for us to be able to run our tests successfully. So, we, we actually found out by chance that why is our test failing in certain things, uh, certain cases? When we investigated more deeper, we figured out, oh, this problem actually happened in older version of Selenium web driver. That's what uh, the forums report. And then we actually looked into saying, okay, we are using the latest Gulp Angular protractor. Which version of Selenium web driver is it really using? And that was pretty old. So that's where the uh, complexity started coming into picture. So the that's there, it, would, it is very difficult to generate more versions of Yeah. We went into a wormhole essentially over that. It was an endless spiral of managed dependencies and packaged dependencies rather inside one uh, plugin uh, over the others. where you do not have to write a uh, code of, for example, an NG report. What it would do is, an HTML element that's there, it would internally go ahead and duplicate it the number of times you want to do it. So all you feed into it is a model, which would be, let's say, a list of rules that you want. And then the Angular compiler will make sure that when it, is, when it converts into an HTML, it then uh, simplifies it or rather extends it, and then uh, renders it as a What this means is, we essentially, by accessing it, have lost a little bit of control in terms of if I want to access the print element or this or a particular property of a particular element there. Since Angular is doing most of the code for writing the extended HTML element there. We also had the project custom directive that was already implemented in the app. We were developers who had written the app earlier and had used uh, either created their own libraries uh, or used some third party libraries. I think they were working on multi thread columns and uh, fancy charts and stuff. Accessing them in our UE tests are also a problem for us. Um, so, the power of Protractor actually lies in synchronization with Angular. What Protractor and why Angular elements Protractor is. But, uh, the Protractor, when you, when you tell it, this is my element, get me the text for it, it will ensure that all asynchronous tasks that are related to that are completed. And then it will give you back the handle so that you are in a way sure that the element is visible on the screen and then you can do an animation. So a lot of boilerplate code of, okay, let me wait for the element to be visible. Or let me wait for a particular element on the page to be visible to be sure that I am on that page is taken care of in program. Fine print by handling promises effectively. Promises, yes. Um, having said that, our application was not completely, completely built on program. 
sir, it will have super angular. It will have certain non-angular aspects in there. So switching between an angular context where the reflector is really helpful and gives us that the confidence where you can assess stuff versus a non-angular where you have to do your boilerplate code and making them work together in the same test execution flow for the challenge that we were doing. Uh, the next part is debug. Since we will need to JavaScript, we need to understand the asynchronous feature of it. This was something that we knew we, we would get a challenge there. Where do you put breakpoint? Where do you put logging? Given promises, trying to understand it. When it is executing, when you are ready to call that. This was one of the challenges that we faced. Uh, the next challenge is uh, around visualization. So, uh, one of our modules does visualization in this format, whatever data we get. It is, uh, for example, this is the country level view of visualization of whatever workforce data we have. The other thing that we also learn is uh, if you zoom in, you get different granularities of data. At the state level, you might get more information versus at the zip code level and things like that. Trying to automate maps was something that was not possible for us. Uh, trying to access elements from Google Maps and see there is a value on it. Uh, so if you actually click on it, it does have some metadata which can show you the data of that particular thing. So trying to capture that information and then actually assert it on test was not something that we were successfully able to do. So what we thought we could probably resort to a visual comparison. If not this, then at least to get some sort of sanity, we could use visual uh, tools and then compare it and see whether uh, things are working fine. Unfortunately, here our product itself was a bottleneck in terms of every time we used to try and import the same information, it used to generate random facts. And even visualization and trying to assert the functionality that we have on maps was something that we could not do. And given the multiple browsers, different combinations that we run in, or the resolution that also changes the aspect of what you see visually. So before we move on to the next section, there have been a lot of people uh, in the room who have worked on Angular applications or working on, on Protractor or have worked on Protractor. Any other challenges you have faced using this? I think three. Like? Yes, you are right. It is there. We were not successfully able to use it with our chaining of methods of promises around that. But you are right. Uh, it does have provision to provide uh, breakpoints. It is. Absolutely. You are uh, spot on. But given that our tool of choice is now protractor, how do we ensure we are able to automate the functionality of a product given certain constraints also that we have in the product? Okay. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what I'm saying is, um, CSS in terms of like before, but later CSS in terms of like the Yeah. Uh, which may very well be the case. Uh, in our case, we just chose to go with the XPath uh, way of interacting with elements. Just like today, yeah. element yeah. in CSS that we want was in XPath. We wonder how it works. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah. So the challenge is in terms of locating elements in different browsers. It works in one case, not the other. And that's what he's sharing. Fair. So uh, let's move on to the next thing about what are the different things we try to do to overcome some of these challenges. Automated, but Automated. not using the functionality provided by those plugins. That said, as of Thursday evening, we have a latest version of WebDriver 2.53 which is not yet available in the latest version of ProTracker. It's there in master, but not released. So which means the latest version of Firefox, which is going to be required uh, for, or rather the latest version of Firefox, which requires the latest web driver, we are not able to use that. We have to hold back on that uh, upgrade of Firefox. So we, are, we still have the problem, but it's still not as bad as before. Like we said earlier, we run our tests, or at least try to run our tests on all environments, from local to CI, as well as running it on an environment, like our QA environment that's there. So what, what we thought that helped us was ensuring that our test data was saved in all environments that was there. So we have like an E2E database copy, which has the data in it, and ensure that we use the same thing for our local versus CI, and uh, the QA environment is there. What, what that helps us is we do not have to end up writing different kind of, have different test data for each different environment. The only thing that really differs amongst environments is very, very environment specific configuration. Like, uh, let's say the URL that you're accessing. It will be local host versus whatever uh, your application URL is on CI as well as uh, your QA environments. Now this test data, again, uh, just to talk a little bit more, the type of test data that we are talking about Workforce, we are trying to optimize for workforce, right? There could be different types of workforces. The workforce size itself can vary a lot. It can go as much as million uh, people in the workforce for whatever reasons, right? So it is a really huge database and there's no way we can really seed that as part of a test data setup. The types of salespeople that we have, the lot of metadata related with executing a functionality, validating a functionality, that is essential and that part is what we are saying we'll keep it same across the different environments we want to run the tests in. So there are two types of changes that happen, right? One is the actual schema changes. And for that, any deployments that happen, we run a migration scripts as part of that to make sure the schema is updated. Now, if the core data itself is changing, you are right, that part has to be managed manually. And that said, that doesn't really change that often, the core data set. We, we also try and make our before and after books a little bit more intelligent to our use the way we wanted to. For example, what we do in before work is we clean up the data that was there as a part of our last test execution. Why we do, do that is we think it is better to actually have, uh, to see the state in which our uh, after which our test ran. One of the reasons why we did that was since this was an inherited product, we did not know all the functionality all at once. So having uh, the state of the application after it ran really helped us in understanding the application as well, after, especially during the initial days. Yeah. What we also ended up doing is uh, coming up with certain utilities uh, in on and above Protractor and in general that, that helped us in uh, 
in kind of overcoming some of these challenges and ge getting more information as to what is happening during the execution. We do we have time? Yeah, cool. we can. Show. So we 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 do have a short. Uh, we have the code on GitHub, but I can we can quickly go through some of the utilities that that we have in our code. Is is this visible? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, th the first and foremost tip would be uh, like th this is the protractor configuration file, and protractor in in their GitHub repo have an extensive configuration file that they have given, which has all the possibilities and different flags that you can use with protractor. The the, the learning that I had was uh, to a see that and see what you can. So most of the tools will already give you certain things that you can do, and you don't have to write boilerplate code for it. So use, read about the tool and see what the tool gives to uh, get most out of it. Well, uh, the first thing uh, that we tried and did was uh, using the capabilities option that that Protractor gives. So we have a bunch of capabilities for uh, different types of browsers that we have: Firefox versus Chrome and uh, Phantom JS depending on different things that we want to do on different uh, browsers and how we change browser on the fly is by an environment variable. So using that capability plus uh, giving it by an environment variable helps us in running our test against different browsers that are there. Um, the next thing that, that helps us, that product actually gives a good uh, capability of uh, running different test suites, which means if, you ha if we have like four modules in our application itself, we can divide our test uh, our specs or test cases uh, in that and say like this is my uh, test cases for module one. So if I know the change has been made only in that module, I can run only a specific subset of all the tests that we have. Since this is something that Protractor already gave us, we uh, use that to our benefit and for each module we have our uh, explicit suite that runs it and especially we have something like a common or a sanity or something that if you want to run all our tests, we run all our tests. This is a sample application, hence you'll just see one example. Uh, the next thing that uh, that we did was uh, using this tool called uh, Jasmine Protractor Screenshot Reporter, which helped us in getting reports. Uh, the only tweak that we made over uh, the reporter was if you can see the output directly on the left, is we have... No, I'm not uh, the what we've done is we've, we've appended a date time stamp to each and every folder that's there. This we do it only locally, so so that whenever, let's say I'm writing a test or I'm running tests multiple times locally, I even have a history of the previous executions that were there, whereas on CI, we only run it once. So the reason this is very important is the challenge that we faced about not able to set breakpoints at the correct place and do debugging effectively we had to resort to another option of taking effective screenshots whenever we want so we can see the state of the application at that point in time and also do a lot of console logging anyway about the actions and verifications that are happening which will enable us if the test fails to quickly trace back through the logs and understand what is gone without having to rerun the test. It's especially important if it's a flaky test which very often happens in E2E as well. So there were two purposes we were trying to solve with this approach. So, so like Anand was mentioning, uh, what we also have is we have the, we have embedded screenshots. So every time a test is executing, at each and every step, wherever we want to take screenshots, we have provided that as a utility, which enables us to take browser screenshots and give it any name that we want. Let's say the screen that you're in or the action that you're performing. What helps us? What helped us was giving, uh, give, appending this number which in a way helps you to see what was the execution and what was the flow in which your test ran. Now there's another challenge with this. Uh, you would think about why do I really need the sequence numbers, right? Uh, the sequence numbers still don't help us 100% as we have learned more about Protractor Angular. We still see the screenshots appearing in different orders and this is again due to the way we have not correctly handled promises potentially in all the places. So what happens with promises is in some cases, if it's not a async call, that method would execute immediately. The async calls would be fired off whenever the response comes, that's when it would really be uh, fulfilled. So you would see based on the sequence of screenshots, the execution flow might not really be the same in all cases. So that is something that 
we fixed in most cases, but still we struggle uh, within uh, some aspects. The other thing which helps us in this screenshot utility, the numbering aspect of it, is if I say, for example, go to the home page multiple times in my test execution, I may end up taking screenshot multiple times of that particular home page. Now, I don't want to handle the aspect of do I need to create a new file name, overwrite the existing file, or whatever things around that. So, just using a unique counter in front of every time I'm taking a screenshot, it makes it very easy. What we also have is, uh, is like a page object model that is implemented where things which are common in all pages like accessing elements which actually use uh, protractor APIs are all in the base page and all you have in your uh, actual uh, pages of your domain is something domain related like get me the main image or get me the title of this page. Um, something that uh, since since we are on this page, uh, uh, where did that go? All oh, right, here it is. So something that uh, remember we had a problem was um, <coughs> Angular versus non-Angular. So the thing that uh, Protractor itself provides is ignoring synchronization, which means Protractor will not wait for promises to be completed, like AJAX call or HTTP request that it does, but then give you the handle directly. So that really helped us in automating uh, the non-Angular aspects of like the login page that we had in our screen. So when we come to the login, we ensure that the protractor's synchronization is turned off. Then we do the action that we want to. We want If we want to log in, do that. And then turn it back on. Wait for Angular to be ready so that we can then use protractor's capability and not have uh, excessive sleep statements that are there in our tests. Uh, this was a big uh, learning for because when we started implementing, we started off with the login page and we, uh, this works beautifully directly out of the box. The minute we went to the Angular page, why is the test failing now? We didn't know why the login test also was failing when the transition happened. And that's where we started really understanding more about what can be done to handle it. One of, one of the last things, so th this is the screenshot uh, utility that we were talking about. So every time we expect, uh, we are on some page or the other, we say, this is my util, take a screenshot, this is the name. And it ensures that it appends the right number depending on the counter that is running. So all we have in our spec is just what page it is, what you want to get out from that page, what your expectation is, and if you want to take screenshots uh, there or not. What we are, uh, there's another thing that we are doing is uh, capturing the JavaScript console logs that are there on the page. And we do it in the after, for, like here, we're doing it in the after hook that is running. Now this uh, spits up a result something like this. So if you see console error, it'll give you a JSON of all the console error that you see on the browser, the console information that you see on the browser, and console warning. This might be uh, thought of as, it's a, it's a good thing to have, and you can actually also go and assert on it. For example, if you have some elements in console errors, that means something has gone wrong. It's not something that your assertion is catching, but then there is something that has gone wrong in your application which you've not tested. So we can also go one step further and add assertions to the, this console log, its console error itself, which says, if this is not empty, fail my test here explicitly. And have something like these also embedded in, also embedded in reports is something that helped us. Yeah. And this can be done at individual action level itself. What we are doing right now is at the end of the test, we are just printing it out. But it's very easy to add assertions at specific actions as well. Uh, let me add here, one of the things that the console warnings especially also helped us with was, we were trying to run our map, uh, the module which has maps in it, tests in and around it on different browsers. And we were clueless as to why is it working on one browser versus another. So there was a certain thing, I think web, uh, web, web GL, GL layer, is something that we were using on top of uh, Google Maps. And only when we looked at the console warning is when we realized that Phantom JS was not able to load that itself. So this actually helped us in figuring out that maybe these tests is something we cannot run on Phantom JS itself. And instead of trying and figuring out what went wrong, we gave up on Phantom JS and then started running our map-based tests on Firefox. So some level of meta information is also helpful if you look a little bit deeper into uh, not just your uh, Application logs, but also the browser logs that are there. I, I think we've covered almost all the yeah. utilities that we had. Okay. 
yeah, we covered everything over there. Apart from this, uh, we handled uh, very specific, we had to create utilities, reusable components rather in our framework to handle various different types of functionalities that our application uh, gave us. Things like chart functions, uh, CSV loader, why? Because we had certain types of files, we wanted to validate the CSV data it downloaded. Models and alerts, because it was inherited product built as an MVP for that matter. In some cases, we had JavaScript alerts showing up. In some cases, we had custom models. Also, there were models, uh, layers of models also possible. So how do you really interact with those effectively? Uh, so we built utilities around that, which any page could call and uh, achieve the correct validations. File upload is something that was very tricky because especially we are running in headless mode. How do we really interact with different browsers and the type of file upload that came up? Now, because we were interacting with, we had control of the product code as well. What we did is we refactored that product code to say what is the action that is triggered after selecting a file from that model and trigger that action directly by executing a JavaScript. And to that, we passed it the file path that would have been passed uh, as if doing it from the browser itself. So we sort of tweaked the product functionality itself to help achieve end-to-end -end automation. Otherwise, we would have had no clues really how to handle it for all different browsers on different OS combinations. Likewise, for file download as well, given a certain set of data, I want to download that file as a CSV. How do I really, clicking on the download button is easy. But in some cases, based on the browser configuration, it will automatically download it to a specified directory or it will throw up a model again to say, okay, where do you want to save this file? What file name do you want? So we did not want to get into these kind of complexities and making sure a test environment is exactly the same every time because someone can come and change the browser configuration on any machine, right? It's a CI machine used by various teams as well. So we bypassed that. What we did is in case of file download, depending on what needs to be downloaded, we saved that file as an expected data file. And whenever we go to that particular screen as part of a test execution, we do whatever actions, we manually scrape the data from the screen and ensure the downloaded file that we had earlier is exactly the same. So that's where our CSV loader also came into picture. We start scraping the data from the screen and compare it with what the CSV file expects instead of actually doing the file download. It saved a lot of effort in terms of how can we validate that functionality. Also locators is very important. Uh, yes, given uh, it's Angular protractor, we can interact with the Angular elements directly using models. It's great for certain types of forms or screens, but especially in case of complex nested structures, it was important to say, uh, so pictureize this, right? There's a table, there's a header row, and of course there is a main body where all the content is. The header row has got column names, which is coming from the model. Now I want to select a specific row for a specific column. How do I really do that? Because of ng repeat and model, I'm not able to get to that element directly. Even if I can, it's going to be really complex in trying to iterate over the rows or you know, some complex XPath manipulations that I would need to do for it. So what we did instead, get into the product code, modify the HTML, give custom attributes. Thanks to Angular over there, I can very easily add in double curly brackets over there, whatever model name or infirm attribute I want to add. And very easily from my test, I'm able to locate specific elements directly. I can say go to row number five, which is based on the index and select column name, uh, first name. And directly I can access that element. It made accessing specific elements very, very easy by using uh, custom locators. So the most important thing why we came across these solutions is we started spending time in learning. Not just go into implementation, learn about the tech stack that you are really using. We started spending time in understanding what JavaScript is, learn that, uh, understand what is Angular, uh, what is Protractor. The documentation is really good for all these. We had just not spent enough time to solve our problems. We directly get into solution mode without understanding what it is. So learning was very important. At the end, did we really solve all our problems? Yes, because we spent time in learning, we built our custom solutions, right? That's what you would think. Would you? Of course, no. There's still a long way for us to go. We are still in this learning journey. We are still trying to implement certain things. A uh, lot of complexity is still remaining. Maps still remains our, our to-do list. How do we automate functionality on the maps? 
there are a lot of suggestions that were made now when I made uh, put in a blog post or request on uh, LinkedIn, Facebook to understand if people uh, have done this type of automation. A lot of suggestions have come in. We have to spend time again investigating those suggestions uh, in more detail, seeing what will work for us, if at all or not. And things like reports. One thing that we did not really show was we get really very basic type of reports right now when our tests run. It just says very, uh, says very simply what is the name of this module, how many specs ran, how many failed, and for each spec, what was the screenshot out of it. Not really very meaningful. So if any test fails for us in CI, we have to go and look at the console logs, which we have made very verbose. We have to look at the console logs and say, when this error happened, which were the set of screenshots that were taken before this to really trace back and understand what was really going on around that. The other aspect that uh, we are getting better at is where to really put assertions. Typically, I would say never put assertions in your page objects. Page objects are dummy. They don't really know. Uh, they should not know what the business functionality is. They should just be getting information or setting information from the page. But in some cases, it is bad practice on our side right now. But that is where we have had to put some assertions, uh, expectations in place to ensure when the promises are uh, called back or promises are fulfilled, it would be triggered correctly. So some work to be done on that from a design perspective of the framework, how to make it better. The other aspect, because we are doing user journeys automation from this uh, tool set, there is not just one assertion that we are really doing. There are a ton of assertions, validations that are implicitly and explicitly happening as part of this user journey execution. So what we really want to do is the first expectation or assertion that fails, we do not want to stop the test at that point in time if it is possible to proceed and continue with other validations as well. Example being, if I want to uh, consider a banking project, I need to log in to transfer funds. If I'm not able to log in, there's no point proceeding with the test. That's a hard assert. But in some cases, I'm able to log in, I'm able to transfer funds, but the labels that I'm seeing is different or some other validation is failing. So I can still continue with other validations and then at the end of the test, capture all those validation failures fail the test saying there were so many errors that happened during this one test execution. So implementing soft assert functionality is something that we want to do to make our test much more richer in terms of getting feedback out of it. Okay. So there are a lot of things that we really want to do. Uh, we will get there sooner or later. There are certain references that we have listed out over here. Uh, you can look at that. The sample project that we showed, uh, we did not really run the test. This GitHub project, the last link, it's available there. Uh, Nikita has built that as a sample application and tests around that. You can use that to get started potentially with your uh, protractor framework. It has protractor config, gulp task, everything set up. The basic utilities that we showed right now, it is all available. You can definitely refer to that, uh, take clone, fork the repo or whatever. If you think there are other utilities that you have, and you would like to contribute that for others as well, please do send in a pull request. That would be most helpful for us as well. With that, given that Naresh is already breaking down the walls, we are really done over here. Uh, Naresh, we have time for questions though, right? Yeah. So uh, do we have any thoughts, questions, or any suggestions what we could have done different or better? So one thing what you said was debugging. We'll definitely look into that. That is on our list. Anything else that we could look at? There's a mic. You can take the screen. So the question is, is it not better to take screenshots only when expectations fail? Yes, uh, of course. But give, absolutely. But many a times you would see, especially when you look at functional automation, the expectation fails not just because of that last action that you did, it's because of the way your execution has been going in the flow. So at important points in time, we are not taking the screenshot automatically. We explicitly stay, uh, say, after this action, take a screenshot so we know what state the application is, and we build the trace of events accordingly. So that's what helps us in debugging as well. I don't want to know why this expectation, rather, I cannot know potentially why this expectation failed, but if I look at the trail of events, it might help me. So it's from that purpose that it helps us. So page is a dummy object. Uh, so the question if others didn't hear, why is it a bad practice to put assertions in page objects? 
Page is a dummy object. All it really knows how to interact with the set of elements it is representing, how to get information from there and how to add information in there. It doesn't have any business logic of is this right or wrong. Whoever is calling the page object knows is this supposed to be right or wrong and that's where the expectation should be. So it's just in terms of having a good framework uh, architecture, having the right level of abstraction details in place, it helps in maintenance and scalability as well. Uh, so, sorry, can you repeat that part? In the page object, you handle the promise yeah. and then uh, return. Mm -hmm. Fair, I, I agree on that and that is the direction we are getting into in terms of we are understanding promises better. We are understanding which APIs return promises or actually are synchronous APIs in a better way. And now we are uh, refactoring, evolving our framework to say, ah, this is a promise. It should actually be handled in the place where it has really been called. The sad thing with that is the handling of promises becomes really bad chaining of sorts from wherever you're calling this, right? So it looks like a really ugly if else, if else kind of uh, code if you have seen those types of code. So yes, there are some trade-offs to be done in that uh, perspective. But I appreciate that idea. That is something that can be done. Can you use the mic, please? Fair point, but I think that's a completely separate topic about why automate or not itself in the first place, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it comes down to the context of why do we want to automate, what tool set do we want to use for automation as well. And that's why we shared our context of the application and the team earlier to ensure that we are doing the right thing based on that context. But fair point, uh, slightly different, but yes, <laughs> you had a thought. Yes, I actually, you know, when you contract for each and every action is written from previously, it's called callback. Even in Kukuna Day, I used to call back right now. It's ice kind of deprecated, but uh, in, uh, right now, they're using promises structure. So each and every action should mm -hmm. return So you can still use the promises in the page object so that the script never fails. Sure. Can still see the function without log in the log. Yeah. So that's where uh, something else. Fair point. So we should look at that. Yeah. Thank you. Any other thoughts? One more. I will think yeah. I will report or reporting. Does that work uh, with yes. Protractor? Yes. Okay. With Protractor. Okay. Mm. Another good tip. <laughs> okay. Excellent. So I think the. Walls have been broken down. Uh, thank you so much for being here.